Can everybody hear me? Uh, if you can't hear me, come sit a little bit closer. Also, if only you, I'm only using point 24, which should be big enough, but if you're all in the back, it might be too small to read the slides. And if you don't care about this talk and you're just sitting here, no problem. I'm just going to do my talk then. So, hello, my name is Bert, of Bert in the Netherlands, but most Americans can't pronounce that, so. Um, I'm a consultant. I work at Deloitte in uh, information management, which means I'm one of those scary people who intrude your privacy sometimes because I do stuff with data. Uh, next to that, I'm also some sort of system engineer. I write Puppet code and SQL code and other code, monitoring code. Oh, I already have water. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, for Deloitte Analytics, which is our software as a service uh, platform, and that's what, our, what my talk will be about. And I try to do uh, the DevOps thing with our developers who write uh, or who create reports for our cloud. I'm not sure if I'm doing the go uh, a really good job at it, but I'm trying anyway. So I'm going to talk about uh, our cloud, which is a software, a business intelligence cloud for software as a, a ser wait, how should I say it correctly? It's a software as a service cloud for business intelligence. I know. Uh, our cloud started off at Numius, which is a small company who was then bought by Deloitte, which meant we didn't have a really big uh, budget. You could say that our cloud has been built the agile way with a small budget and continuously improving. And we're trying to keep on doing that because we still don't get a big budget from, uh, from my company. Uh, but I think at the moment we're doing pretty good. Uh, in the two years and a half, we have this uh, platform. We have learned a lot. We have made a lot of mistakes. So I'm going to try to explain you what mistakes we made and what are the attention points if you want to do your own cloud. So when I when I normally say cloud, what, what do most people, what sort of cloud do most people think about? Yeah, probably uh, an infrastructure cloud like uh, Amazon, the Amazon cloud, or the, the Microsoft Azure cloud. But as, as you can see, uh, Gartner said in August 2013 that Amazon Web Services was uh, lonely at the top, I would say. And if you see all these other big companies like HP or IBM, uh, or Microsoft, they're, they're not even they're niche players, they don't even come close. Uh, I, I think that means you shouldn't try to start your own infrastructure cloud because you're probably not going to beat Amazon since you probably don't have the budget HP or Microsoft or IBM or whoever has. So my idea is let's start a software as a service cloud because uh, a software, software as a service is really uh, a niche most of the time. So it's more easy to differentiate yourself in it. It's more easy to be the market leader or near the market leader of, uh, of a small niche than of something as broad as uh, infrastructure uh, services. Nobody can read this slide probably, but what, what, what it is saying is that they uh, expect to pretty much double uh, the, the, well, since 2013 to 2016, they expect to at least grow another 40%. And the biggest growth can be found in uh, SaaS clouds. So that's the one you should look at, I guess. Um, so SaaS, as I said, it's a niche market. You can do a lot of SaaS clouds, because there are a lot of products. The only requirement for the product, I guess, is that it has a web interface, because it needs to be accessible over the web. 
Um, and also, I'm not a big fan of Gartner, but they have nice graphs. That's why I'm using them. Uh, this much, um, th they say that the biggest growth in the next five years would be in, in office suites or in database management systems or in computing services. And even those are quite broad, I guess. Um, but nobody can read the slide. These slides will come on SlideShare. You can review it later, or you can search the Gartner re report yourself if you're interested. So the main thing is search something, choose a product you're passionate about, search a product you already know, preferably, because you're going to run it uh, for clients. It might make sense if you know what you're doing. Um, but, but also listen to your clients. That's something we do, we do a lot, and our clients really appreciate it. Um, we ask our main clients what's the next feature we should implement, and we also ask them how much money do you want to get for that next feature. So we try to, to make our clients pay for extra development. And yeah, stay in your niche. It's really hard to, do, to be good at everything. Uh, If you make a web front end, which you need, uh, you have two options. You can build it yourself or you can buy one. We chose to buy one from IBM. Uh, we do business intelligence, like I said, and IBM has the best or one of the best products for business intelligence, and our consultants have a lot of experience with it. So for us, it's a win-win situation. We sell a product uh, or a service as the cloud to our clients. At the same time, we sell them also some consultants to the, to the uh, real implementation. And I think that's a good strategy for us. Uh, and it would have been way more expensive to, to build a new front-end ourselves. Uh, but whatever you choose, make sure it scales because you don't really know how many people will get on the cloud. We'll start from zero, but if you look at something like Facebook or Twitter, it can grow tremendously fast. If you're business to business like we are, it will grow slower, but still it needs to sort of handle more load than your typical uh, infrastructure at inside the office. And uh, because you'll have multiple clients, make sure your system supports multi-tenant uh, systems because, yeah, <laughs> it just makes sense. So the, the thing is, if you log into a web service, you always see the web service, right? That's the only thing you see. But there's way more to, to, the, to what you see. Um, like you need most of the time a database. But you'll also need a load balancer. You'll also need an authentication system, yay LDAP. Uh, you need operating systems, you need storage, you need uh, security systems around it, you need um, a lot of, complica uh, of complicated stuff, and don't underestimate that, because everything, so you have this complex system, and the, 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 the even a small thing that, that fails can interrupt your whole service. Um, you'll need hardware also to run it on or you can go to the cloud. For our uh, computating, computating services, we chose for blades um, because they are easy to extend, right? And they don't need, uh, they don't need that much space. Uh, another advantage is you need uh, you get a very fast network internally between the blades, which makes sense if, you, if you're doing uh, parallel uh, calculations. And we also use it as a virtualization platform. Uh, 
you need at least two blade centers. We ha had the problem before that we only had one. As I said, we don't, we don't have that much money. So we thought maybe it's not that much of a problem if you only have one blade center. I mean, what can go wrong with the blade center? It's just a metal box with switches inside and blades inside and everything inside. But the center itself is just a stupid box, right? Turns out they have an active back plate and that one can fail too. So <clears throat> that was a painful moment when that one failed and our whole system went out of production. <laughs> so buy, buy two and preferably put one in another, if you have to, put one in another data center because um, something could go wrong in one data center. Like which happened two weeks ago, I think, here in the Netherlands. The uh, data center went out of business, or was it in Belgium? I forgot the exact details. Um, yeah, you better have two data centers then. And full active support at the other side too of all your systems. Um, you'll need storage, you'll, you'll need a lot of storage because we are in a data-driven world, as I said in my talk yesterday. Data is growing tremendously fast. So you have two options. Or you buy big storage boxes from EMC or something, or IBM, or who, who, who sells those boxes. And they have some advantages, because they're, they're fast and they're easy to set up. I mean, you put them there, you plug in the power and the network, and they work, but they're, they're pretty expensive. And scaling them is, I mean, you buy big boxes, so it's very expensive, uh, yeah, it's very expensive to, to scale. Uh, what we do instead is we buy normal uh, Intel hardware, but internal, internal storage, like two unit racks uh, systems, in racks, and they're also fast because we have like 12 disks in them, which we put in uh, RAID 1, uh, RAID 10. And we use a, a cluster software on it, which can be, or maybe it's not always, open source. But the biggest advantage is we have at the moment, uh, I think, eight such machines, machines, and we can pull a 10 gigabit line uh, full. So, or I would say our storage is pretty fast at the moment. That's definitely not the bottleneck for us. And, and it's, it really scales because such a server is, com if you compare it to a, a real storage box, very cheap. So you just add servers and you just extend the, the cluster and uh, with, a, with a parallel storage uh, software. And another option is go to the infrastructure cloud, go to Amazon, or go to Rackspace, or go to Elastic Host, I think is Dutch partner. Um, they're, they're not as cheap, I think, as buying your own hardware, if you really need the hardware, but uh, you lose a lot of, um, they don't give you that much headache, I think. I've heard a lot of positive things about Rackspace. We, we use uh, Elastic Host for our disaster recovery uh, systems. I mean, it makes sense that you don't have all knowledge in, in, in house, and we chose not to invest in hardware knowledge. We, uh, we have a partner who does that for us. And, um, but but if, that, if, that not, if that is not an option, going to a software as, a, uh, as an infrastructure as a service uh, provider, totally makes sense. So now that we have chosen everything, the work starts. And I don't know if you, if you like work. I kind of do, but I mean, it will take a lot of uh, work. The first thing you have to do is decide on your standards. 
which I guess makes sense now. It makes sense to me now, but it didn't make sense to me uh, two years ago when we started. We just started <laughs> because we were with only three peop two people, I mean, and um, we, we, we talked to each other and we said, yeah, we're going to do it this way and this way. But then half a year later, we kind of changed that a little bit and then even half a year later, that also changed again. So at the moment, our old infrastructure doesn't make any sense anymore. Uh, and that sometimes hurts. So choose your standards before you start uh, to, to really implement stuff. You'll need a cloud management so uh, software if you, need uh, if you do virtualization. It can be uh, OpenStack because like, I have the impression every company now supports OpenStack, be it Red Hat, be it Canonical, be it IBM. We chose to use Open Nebula, but it doesn't really matter. And you need a configuration management system like Puppet or Chef or Ansible because um, they help you in developing your systems and they keep your systems standardized. I mean, if I install or configure SSH on one server in Puppet, it means it will have this configuration on all servers. And that's what, what you want if you build servers, uh, clusters I mean, you, don't want cha uh, you, you want those clusters to be identical because one change, uh, if, if things are different on different servers, changing from the master or, or the slave or whatever can, uh, can give you trouble. Um, or my advice would be if you, if you set up clusters, which you need, you need 2N everywhere. Does, does anyone, everybody understand what 2N means? Can everybody read it? No? That's sad. Um, <laughs> uh, 2N means you at least need two uh, instances from every product. Right? Because if one fails, the other one needs to take over. And if you, all tools, almost all tools use data, be it DNS, which is almost no data, but still, be it LDAP, be it the database itself. Um, so you need to replicate those to the slaves or to the other instances and use the replication system inside the tool. I've seen clients where they use like a storage um, replication for databases. It's, I wouldn't say, I would say it's not as good. Use Postgres or MySQL, I don't care, or whatever database, and use the replication inside the database. Use Open LDAP, don't use the RDB we need it. Use the uh, replication system in Open LDAP because it works and it's supported by the Open LDAP people. So if you have pro uh, problems with it, you go on IRC, and you go tell them, like, I have a problem, how do I fix it? Uh, set up a high availability system. W what I mean by that is, so you have your replication, but it doesn't mean you have the, the failover capabilities. You need a tool like um, Keep Alive D or something, which sets your IP. Uh, and migrates your IP on a, on a node failure, or you need other tools who uh, make it easier to do a switch from master to slave or from slave to master when, when something fails. Um, search for those tools, make your life as easy as possible, because in the moments you'll need them, you don't really want to, 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 to go search everything again. Uh, because it's complicated to do stuff. Make sure you have the scripts uh, available for you so you can do your failovers or your migrations or, your, or whatever you need to do in a stressful moment with one simple command so, uh, without you having to think about it. And integrate LDAP, which probably also makes sense for most people because uh, it's no, f well, it, it's easy to, to, to uh, maintain your. Uh, users inside the platform then. And this is my favorite slide, as always. Um, what happens if something goes wrong? In most cases, 
all hell breaks loose. Take backups, please. I don't say you have to uh, and make a disaster recovery plan. I'm not saying you have to, you need to have a disaster recovery uh, site. I guess that depends on your SLA. But at least make a plan and migrate your backups to, to other sites because there are so many stories of people who, who take who only take backups to local disks or even to another server in the same data center but who don't move it away to another data center. And uh, that, that can be really bad. Like uh, when I was on a, on a Postgres training about high availability in Postgres, I heard a story about uh, a company in Italy who, um, who, who maintained all the data of the blood bank. And I think four years ago, five years ago, I'm not sure, the, uh, the, 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 the big earthquake happened in, in, in Italy. So that data center crashed all together with all the servers inside. And the people there, the, the blood bank, only had one server, or maybe a couple of servers, but one data center where all the data was, including the backups. So you can imagine what happens if all people in the region need blood because they're wounded from the, uh, the earthquake and they don't have access to the blood bank because all servers are down. No, you can't imagine. Anyway, nothing good happens, so take care of your backups and take care of a plan to restore those backups when things go wrong. Um, yeah, security is also important. I mean, you have client data. And for one of the things you need to do is set up procedures. And don't we all hate procedures? No. Um, I know I hate them. I, I, I don't want yeah, I don't want them, but we, we, need, we need them because they ensure that our uh, secure uh, your, our platform is secure uh, and standardized and standardized things make things secure right. If you can have a checklist of things that need to need to happen, also use audit software that automatically checks all the security policies on your systems. Uh, because changing things can be harmful. More important is change management, and I guess that happens in every company now, but it didn't, uh, it didn't always happen uh, at our place, and we, we had to test some, some stuff uh, and change management and how to do it. I mean, we were smart enough to test or stuff before we deploy to production. We, we never had problems with that. But we found out that it's easier for, or better for clients, clients accept it better, if, you're, uh, if, you, if you make big releases, like every six months, a big release, or every four months, it doesn't matter. Uh, but you need to come with big releases. So inside of our team, we work with agile development because that's the new cool thing, right? Everybody likes Agile and Lean. But clients don't really like it if you change something to their platform every week, we have found. So what we do is we, we, we run our development track in, on development, which makes sense. And we push all code to uh, acceptance. And when it's checked with acceptance, it goes to a fourth platform, which is called staging. It just stays in staging until we have a release date Every four months, we release uh, during our maintenance weekend uh, the new features. And we have found that clients like that more than have a weekly or bi-weekly release moment. That's why, what I mean with the deployment batches. And now my favorite topic, monitoring. Who, who recognized the sentence? Ev not everybody? Hmm. <laughs> okay. Anyway, according to InnoBudget or InnoTime, uh, monitoring is usually an afterthought. 
And that's true. If I talk to management at our company, if I talk to technical people at other companies, don't forget, I also do consultancy, um, monitoring is always an afterthought. We put things, we, we needed to put things in production and I, I asked them like, what's your monitoring plan for it? Uh, or, or system, do I need to re uh, write a plan? And they're like, well, we just do a ping test and we see if it's online or not. I guess that's monitoring, but that's not what I mean with monitoring. It, obviously, you need to be sure, uh, you need to check if, if, your, uh, if your systems are up or down. Uh, but please monitor every freaking detail of your system that you can monitor. This is normally the point where I start uh, showing off at my monitoring system, but uh, I can't access the VPN here, so I can't show you. But uh, set up metrics, set up alerting when, when strange things happen. Even if they are not strange, I mean, we have, I, I get approximately 20 emails a day from our monitoring system, I would say, and approximately 20 are false positives, but I'd rather have 20 false positives each day than one problem a month that isn't detected. Uh, so, and if you're in operations mode, what else would you do than check out your platform, right? <laughs> and analyze the data, keep your data, Keep everything you can uh, about your system in, in, in the data warehouse and, and, and check the growth, check for real stuff uh, daily or at least weekly um, and learn from it. Set up your, 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 uh, your ideas about it up. And Monitor everywhere. What I mean with everywhere is do the monitor and development and acceptance also, not only in production. Because you don't want to be you don't want and you don't want to get surprises in production, right? If you don't know how it behaves or not exactly knows how it behaves uh, for a longer time in development or in uh, acceptance, and give each other feedback. I mean. We're lean, right? So we talk to the developers who work in development branch and the operators work in production branch. If we see weird stuff, which due to, to the higher load doesn't come uh, visible in development or acceptance, this is the way to tell them, like, can we replicate it? Yes. Can we replicate on development? Probably also yes. Uh, so make, fix it and test it in development before you go to acceptance and in production again. I think this is a, an important sentence. If it's not monitored, it doesn't exist. It's not supported. It's not, definitely not in production. Um, yeah, so monitor everything. Oh, this, slide, this image should be somewhere else. You can't read it probably, but yeah, it's an example of the monitoring. Uh, think about what you want to do. Find a niche uh, for your product. Make sure everything scales because you'll have more clients later on, hopefully, or you'll die. That's also a possibility. Uh, automate as much as possible. Write puppet scripts like chef or chef scripts, whatever. Uh, automate your monitoring. Monitor everything. Um, op automate your op uh, your maintenance if that's possible with scripts. So I'm done here. It was a bit too fast, I guess. And this is definition of done, by the way. Are there? Questions. Hopefully, yes. I have time to answer. They can no. Okay. Yeah, about uh, false positives. In my, my experience, if you, uh, if you have too many uh, false positives, then the natural tendency of people is to ignore uh, ignore all uh, all uh, messages from the monitoring system. Yes. 
that is true. <laughs> uh, and, and, and I'm not saying I'm not trying to fine tune them, but I'd rather have more false positives while fine tuning them than that's maybe a better explanation than to wait until or, or, or to set my limits too high now so I never have, uh, have a message. And at the same time, never have uh, uh, the, the, the real errors too. Because there is a reason, right, why I get those false positives. Something is happening, but it's not entirely correct. So I'm calling them false positives because they're not critical, but there's still something in the platform. But they're annoying during the night, that's true. <laughs> More questions? Who here works at the company uh, which provides this kind of platform? Two people. And uh, what? who thinks about setting up a, its, its, its own SaaS platform? Nobody? It's the future, they say. <laughs> okay, one person. Cool. Oh, I think it was a bit too fast, but that was it, I guess. It was brilliant. Thank you.